Welcome to The Apartment Guys, where we dive deep into all things multifamily investing. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and empower real estate investors to reach their highest potential. Each week, host Tate Seamer interviews high-level guests from all over the industry who are sure to bring valuable, actionable ideas that will propel your career to the next level. Whether you're just starting out or a seasoned investor, you are in the right place. And now your host, the apartment guy, Tate Seamer. Uh, most of the episodes that we do on this show are like my babies and I love them all. And this one is uh, particularly so. Uh, I, you know, in life, people come along kind of um, that that really change things for you and really shift things for you. Uh, and that doesn't happen very often, but when it does, it's really profound. And um, they say when, when the, something like when the student is ready, the teacher will arrive or something like that, uh, or the teacher will arrive when the student is ready. And what I found is that hiring a personal coach, uh, which I did this year, has been a total game changer for me. Uh, I hired uh, Dr. Jamil Syedj, who is a naturopathic physician, amongst other things. He's trained in neurolinguistic programming and is a real master coach and uh, has shifted things for me in profound ways. And I'm so excited to get to share his wisdom, his technology with you. This could be a game-changing episode for you like a life-changing episode for you. Just consider that if you really get, dig into this and take this stuff to heart and take the actionable items and run with them, this can really change and shift. So this is powerful stuff. This is a deep dive. It deserves your focus and your attention. And so I hope you really get a lot out of it. And I hope that it's a, a needle mover for you in your life and in your business. Uh, on that, Remember to go to www.investwithgreenlight.com to sign up for our investor list. We have ongoing deals right now, um, particularly in the Oklahoma City market. And as always, we're working in the Columbus market on finding deals as well. And uh, if you want to hear, be the first to hear about those, go sign up for our investor list. Uh, www.investwithgreenlight.com. You can also download the ebook that I wrote called FIRE, which stands for Financially Independence, Retire Early via Apartment Investing. And uh, it's all about creating this life that your entire life is paid for in all its aspects through passive income achieved through multifamily investing. Super exciting vision. It's freedom. It's power. And uh, it's kind of why we all are all in this game in addition to whatever other whys we have, uh, like mine in particular is service, right? Like education and service. So um, it's not the only reason, but passive income is a big reason why this apartment investing game is so fun and is so uh, exciting. So on that, again, my coach, Dr. Jamil Saej, I hope you get a ton out of this. It's like gold, guys. Like this podcast, these free podcasts, you can get so much out of them. And I hope that you do this. So without further ado, uh, enjoy. Welcome everybody back. Here we are with another episode of the Apartment Guys podcast. And, you know, to me, the mindset piece of this game, if you want to call it a game or this, this space, this apartment investing um, venture that we're all on together, the mindset piece is, is absolutely foundational and is core uh, part of every aspect of this business. And there's really very little that you can do to correct for a, a mindset that's not necessarily ideal or working very well or serving you very well. Uh, on the on the other hand, when you have your mindset dialed and you're focused and you're intentional 
and you are uh, moving the needle in your life in all areas of your life in the direction of success, uh, your mindset can be uh, the most wonderful servant, really, I think. And um, so I have uh, hired a, I like to call him a success coach, a, a life um, business relationship coach is what he calls himself. He's a international life business and relationship coach. And uh, uh, his name is Dr. Jamil Sayeg. And, and I have so uh, loved and um we, we've been working together now almost half a year. Uh, it's, it's, it's getting close to June of 2021 as we're recording this. And uh, we've been working together for about six months and I've had, you know, just transformative results uh, in my life. And uh, I attribute so much of that to a lot of the coaching that we've done uh, that uh, Dr. Jamil and I have done together. So um we are lucky enough to that he's agreed to come on the podcast and share some of his wisdom and expertise with us and inspiration. A um, little bit about Dr. Jamil. He is a integrative naturopathic physician, a master NLP practitioner. NLP stands for neuro linguistic programming. We, we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, I'm a huge fan and and uh, of NLP. I think it's fascinating, powerful stuff. Um, and he's also the author of the book, 20 Steps to Your Next Breakthrough. Um, he works with leaders and high performers from all walks of life, and including world champion athletes, best-selling authors, entrepreneurs, business professionals, and more to create an extraordinary life without regret. So, Dr. Jamil, I am really stoked to have you on the show, and I appreciate you coming on, man. Thanks so much. Absolutely, Tate, man. I appreciate you. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be with you all. And it's, uh, it's been such a privilege to be with you for the last six months or so. And it's crazy when you said, yeah, it's almost been <laughs> six months. Time flies. I remember that when we first started. And, uh, yeah, I hope everyone is tuning in is in a great space and they're ready for some magic and yeah you know, i'm excited to be with you all and the magic comes not only from it's not like a me thing it comes from you bringing your presence and being here fully with us mm. and i i think there's some miracles that can happen for people just for yeah so yeah and on that note i i mean i'd really encourage you as listeners to really tune into this and and you know pick up a pen and some paper and take some notes we're going to be talking about 10 principles to get the most out of yourself and perform at the highest levels and coming from you know, getting this kind of high level coaching, if you will, uh, mentorship, guidance, whatever you want to call it from somebody like Dr. Jamil is, is really a rare opportunity. And it's an, it's an opportunity to invest, you know, however, 30 minutes, 45 minutes, however long an hour or so in, in yourself and in making yourself better and making, getting yourself to perform at higher levels. And, you know, we're, this is obviously not directly related to investing in apartments, but in, uh, in many ways it is. And I think it's again, like in some ways more relevant or more um, broadly relevant um, to, to this whole game than, than a lot of the other uh, subjects that we've covered. So, um, so anyway, I, I, I'm, I'm really stoked. I encourage everybody to be present and, uh, you know, if you're on the treadmill, that's awesome. If you're driving, that's awesome. And, and, uh, we're honored to Dr. Jamil and I are honored to get to spend this little bit of time with you. So Dr. Jamil, I'm going to kind of hand, hand the reins over to you and, and, uh, let you take control. Awesome, man. Thank you so yeah. much. And, you know, I am somebody that, in my opinion, strongly understands the value of time. And I understand that every single one of you who are here with us, whether it's, you know, on the YouTube video, on the podcast, in whatever way you're listening and, and absorbing this and being present, you could be spending that time doing so many other things. And I respect that. I acknowledge that. And I know Tate does as well. And we thank you for being with us. And my intention is to create as much value as I possibly can for you in this time. And so if anyone's tuning into the video, I'm sharing my screen right now. So you'll be able to 
take a look at what I'm talking about. And if you're listening, I will do my best to make it so it's as if you were here with us and you can hear it all. So as Tate mentioned, today we're talking about 10 principles to get the most out of yourself and perform at the highest levels, how to achieve more with less. Yeah, I've been really fortunate over the years to work with leaders and high performers, like Tate mentioned, from all walks of life. Many of them are in the real estate space, from investors to brokers to agents to loan officers. And one thing that they all have in common is they choose, they decide to be leaders and high performers. That's the first thing that I really want you to let sink in. Being a high performer, being a leader is not something that you're born with. It's not you have it or you don't. And if you're listening to this and you think you don't have it, you're just screwed. No, you choose it by stepping into it. And now, so just to define it, when I think of a leader, I think of a person who wants to make an impact. They want to make a difference. It's not just about themselves. Maybe it's about a partner. It's about a family. It's about their company. Maybe it's about their community. And depending on the size of their vision, maybe it's about the country. It's about the world, but it's not just about them. And when I think about a high performer, it's somebody who no matter what they're doing, they want to be and do the best they can at the things that matter most to them. And so again, you get to decide, do I want to be a leader? Do I want to be a high performer? In some respects, you already are. And in some areas, maybe you can pick that up a little bit. Maybe you could strengthen that and show up more powerfully than you currently are. There's people listening who are spectacular parents, and maybe they're not leading their team as well at work. Or maybe they're blowing it away at work and they're crushing it, and their relationship with their partner, with their kids, aren't anywhere near as good. So just getting clear for yourself, the past doesn't equal the future. And right now, in this moment, you get to decide, where do I want to step up my game? And just by doing that, so much can change. Today, I'm going to share with you some tools, some strategies, and some ways of being, places you can come from to really show up and get the most out of yourself. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Tate will have all my contact info. And if you were here live, we'd answer it then. But if it's going to be a message, I'm looking forward to hearing from you. And so a couple guidelines, Tate alluded to it as well, some guidelines to get the most out of this experience. I recognize that if this is something you're listening to as a podcast, maybe you're driving, maybe you're working out, maybe you're on the treadmill, like Tate said, you're doing something else at the same time, and that's wonderful. And if you could take notes, whether you listen to it once and you just sit with it and you take notes, or maybe you drive and you do what you're doing, and the next time you listen to it, you take notes, you sit down, pen and paper, and you really write out what are the things that are standing out for you. You want to take it a step further, you, you, you look at it again within 48 hours. It's like a studying practice. You're present with it. And then you want to take, take it a step further, try to teach it to somebody. By teaching it to somebody, by listening as if I'm going to be teaching this to somebody, you will absorb it even deeper. And so coming from that place will really allow you to get the most out of this. Second is remain open-minded. Some of the things we'll talk about, you've heard before. Some of the things you haven't. And I, the open-mindedness comes from this perspective of not falling into the trap of, oh, I already know that. I've heard that before, because oftentimes I find there's a very big difference between what you know and what you actually do. And so you might say, I've heard that before, but you don't live it. You say, I know it, but your, your life isn't a reflection of that. And so if we were to check our ego at the door and say, I'm going to show up with a beginner's mind, I'm going to show up as a student. There's a beautiful perspective that I love, this idea that the master has mastered the art of being a student forever. There's no place where you just got it. You don't have to learn anymore. You just figured it all out. It's a never-ending process. And so when you show up from this place of the beginner's mind and say, I'm just going to be present and I'm going to notice, where can I improve? Where can I step my game up just a little bit? And the last one is play all out. You know, give 100% of this experience to you. You know, if, you, if possible, eliminate as many distractions as possible. Oftentimes, especially in this kind of digital Zoom environment, We've got 50 things going on in the background. We've got the email, we've got notifications, buzzes and bings and the phone and all these things. And it takes you away from being present. And throughout this experience today, there's one aspect in particular that's coming to mind right now that'll help you see exactly why that distraction is really killing a lot of the productivity and performance that you could be experiencing. And then again, if at the end, if there's any questions that I can answer for you, please feel free to reach out. And you're going to learn the best when you're having fun. So let's put as much of you into this as possible so you can get as much out of it as possible. One thing that my promise to you is these next 60 minutes or so can be truly transformational and it literally has nothing to do with me. 
And I find that, you know, fascinating because we think that someone else is going to give us something that we don't have. We think someone else is going to teach us something. We think that, oh, this guy's going to fix me. You're not broken. There's nothing to fix. So my intention, I said earlier, was to create as much value for you as possible. Understanding though, that I'm only half the equation. You're the other half and how you choose to show up can determine what you get from this. If you're really present, if you're really with us, you will get what's here for you. The example I like to share, imagine you're on a plane and there's a flight attendant right in the beginning of the flight. And I'm sure we've all had the experience of being on this plane. And you know, the, the comedian George Carlin talks about, here we are, a, a plane full of grown adults, and this person is teaching us how to use a seatbelt. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, we laugh about it, and we've all pretty much had the experience. Now, what are we doing while the flight attendant's up there, you know, share, excuse me, sharing with us the safety guidelines? Most of the time, we're listening to something with our headphones. We're talking to somebody else. We're fidgeting with our bag. We're doing something, but we're doing anything but paying attention mm -hmm. because we say, I know that already. Yep. And at the same time, I want you to imagine there you are on your flight and the flight attendant walks out and you're already in the air. And the flight attendant says, we're going to crash. And if you listen to what I have to say in the next 30 seconds or so, you might survive. Now, my question to you is, would you listen differently? Would you bring a level of presence? Would your music no longer be as important in that moment? Would the person you're having a conversation with to your left or to your right, are you just going to ignore the flight attendant to keep talking? And the answer is no, because in that moment, you see that your life is on the line. This is literally a life or death situation. Well, I view an experience like this as no different because what your future looks like is dependent on what you decide to do right now. And so this is a life or death situation because how much you decide to show up to this will determine what you receive and what you receive literally gives life or takes life away from that future version of you that you would love to become. And so keep that in mind as you show up and bring as much presence into this as possible. Mm -hmm. So just want to give a quick background. Why am I here? You know, first and foremost, I respect and love the hell out of Tate. And I think mm -hmm. that He's an amazing guy doing wonderful work. And when he asked, when he invited me to be on this show, I was like, I'd absolutely love to, to join and contribute as much as I possibly can. Second, you know, I'm here to give you all a powerful experience, the heart and soul of what I do, some of what Tate's experienced in person and provide as much value to you as possible. I want to have fun and make this a great experience. There's no sales pitch. You know, I've been a part of so many different events and groups and both as a participant and as you know, an attendee. And I've seen people, unfortunately, go up and speak for an hour, speak for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and it's just like a nonstop, buy my stuff. And not only was that not really valuable, but it gets frustrating to a lot of people. And that's not my intention at all. My intention at all is to really blow you away from this perspective that I'm likely to not see and hear from you. Some people might reach out, but many of you I won't hear from. And I want to make sure that I can contribute to you in any way I possibly can. And when it comes down to it, you know, partnering with people to transform their life, make their dreams come true and create more fun, freedom and fulfillment. I really look for that. Anything else? And I trust that if that's you, if this resonates with you, then you'll reach out. I'll hear from you and we'll talk again. And so let's dive in to today. We said 10 principles to get the most out of yourself. Principle number one is the principle of perspective. And for those of you who can't see the slide right now, it says life. Every one of us has had an experience at one point or another, some of us many experiences of things happening in our life that in the moment we, we perceived the bad. You know, some of the way you lost a job, economy crashed, something happened. And prior to that, maybe you didn't see it coming. Maybe life was completely different. And it's not always a bad thing. It can be a great thing too when life changes in an instant. But the, the point being that life can change in an instant. I'm going to share with you a personal story of mine that has been so integral in my, in my foundation, excuse me, and in the work that I do. And I ask that you listen to it, not just as this is something that happened to me. I want you to listen to it as it relates to you. And I want you to see what wisdom, what nuggets of gold are in it for you that you can begin applying to your life immediately. So when I was 19, my dad had a brain aneurysm. 
And for anyone who's not familiar with that, imagine one of the blood vessels in your brain, think of it like a tube, and it starts to balloon out. And if you're fortunate, you pretty much have a really bad headache and you go to the hospital, they take care of it. And a couple of days later, you're good. My father wasn't as fortunate. His brain aneurysm ruptured. He was rushed and he had a four hour brain surgery. And we were told it was the worst aneurysm the neurosurgeon ever saw. And his survival chances were less than 5%. And you can imagine, you know, in those four hour wait, like 30 years, every second looking at the clock, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And after the four hours, he survived. Now we were told that he probably wasn't going to survive, but if he did, he probably would be in a coma and they didn't know if he'd ever wake up. And so when he survived, it was already a miracle, you know, less than 5% and he made it. Well, to the room and he's in a coma. And to give some context, my dad was a family practice physician. He was 49 years old. I was 19 at the time. And he also was one of the top three Elvis impersonators in the world. <laughs> you know, music was his passion. He loved, he loved people. His patients loved him. Greatest bedside manner like I'd ever seen. Beautiful mm. heart. But he had a lot of energy. And he would do these massive concerts. He, he'd actually traveled the world with Elvis's real band. Like He had so much life to him. And there I was walking into this room and seeing him. And it was like a train hit him, you know, 50 wires, trakes, all this stuff coming out of him. And I don't mean to make it graphic, but just to give you the idea of where I was at at the moment. And in that moment, it was so humbling to just see, wow, I've never seen somebody this almost like vulnerable. I was like, wow, this guy is the epitome of what it meant to be a man for me. This person's my dad. I look up to this guy and he's such a strong hearted, but loving guy. And here he is. And in this moment, there was two emotions I was feeling. One was this sense of helplessness because I wanted to do something. I wanted to improve his chances. And outside of prayer, there wasn't anything I could do. I was just watching and waiting. And we were told he could die at any moment. The second emotion, which, which was this profound and immense sense of regret. Hmm. I had felt in that moment that I had taken my relationship with my dad for granted. You know, there's a quote by the, in Buddhism, you know, I, I, or it's allegedly in Buddhism, I heard it a while ago, but the idea being the problem is you think you have time. Mm -hmm. And there I was at 19 and my priorities were, you know, sports and my friends and video games and movies and hanging out and doing all that. But it wasn't, you know, let me get to know my dad. It wasn't, let me connect with him on a soul to soul, like man to man level. This is like one of my parents. Let me see what they're all about. Now it wasn't in my thought process at all. Like it isn't for many people, especially people who are younger. And um, in that moment, I felt that I messed up. I felt that I wasn't going to have that chance. You know, there's a quote by the Dalai, Lama, the, the Dalai Lama where he says, most people live as if they're never going to die. And then they die having never really lived. And every single one of us has people in our lives and we don't know how long we're going to have them. We, we might have them for another 50 years, 70 years, 80 years, depending on how old they are. And at the same time, they could be gone in an hour. Mm -hmm. And that's never meant to be pessimistic. That's mm -hmm. meant to be as practical and real as possible. You know, if I told you, you have a year to live guaranteed, but then you're going to die the following day, you know, what would you do? And you might paint this whole beautiful story for me. But then if I tell you, that's actually better odds than you have right now, because I just guaranteed you a year. You have no guarantee right now. You're living under the assumption that you've got 30 years, you've got 50 years, you've got 80 years. And I hope you do. But keeping in mind that you don't know. And when you don't know, stop waiting. Stop living from fear. Stop playing small. And this is an aspect of the story as I continue it. I had felt this immense sense of regret. And I was uh, fortunate that we basically had another three years before he did, where he did ultimately pass away. Hmm. And I took several years off after college to be one of his primary caregivers. And in those three years, I learned so many lessons about myself, about life. I had my patients tested. Anyone who's been a primary caregiver can attest to it drained you mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually to take care of somebody who not only has a hard time taking care of themselves, but they can't be left alone. Like somebody always has to be with them because something could happen to them. And in a sense, you know, the roles were almost reversed where I was kind of being the fatherly figure at that moment. And in that time, I had my prayers answered. I had some days where I spent 10 to 15 hours a day with him.
singing mm-hmm. together, boxing together, physical therapy, talking, watching shows, dinner, meals. And uh, it was really wonderful. And there were also moments where he had short-term memory loss and he forgot who I was. There was moments where he was prone to seizures after that aneurysm mm-hmm. and he was having those all the time. We almost lost him several times. And it, it just showed me the value of right now, the value of today. Every day, 150,000 people don't wake up. And every one of you listening to this are not one of those people. So already you woke up, you hit the lotto. And if the people that, if some or more or some or most of the people that you care most about also woke up, it's like, wow, like what an added bonus. But most of us live our lives from this kind of unconscious place of something needs to happen that I consider to be extraordinary, like out of the ordinary for me to feel good. For me to think today's a great day. When the fact that you woke up, the day's already amazing. Regardless mm-hmm. of where you woke up, regardless of how, how much money you have, regardless of any of the stuff, you woke up. That is a blessing that's denied every day to around 150,000 people. That perspective, in my opinion, is powerful. That perspective mm-hmm. shifts things because you start appreciating the moment. You know, there's a Steve Jobs commencement speech for Stanford. It's on YouTube. If anyone hasn't seen it, check it out. It's amazing. But he basically says, every day I wake up and I look myself in the mirror and I ask, if today was my last day on this earth, would I want to do what I'm about to do? And if the answer is no, too many days in a row, I know something needs to change. And then he also said either earlier or after in the same speech, um, if you live every day like it's your last, one day you will surely be right. (laughs) And so again, that doesn't mean don't plan. You know, sometimes people make that... um, kind of not an error in thinking, but some people think, oh, you know, I live in the moment. I do too. But the thing is that you plan for the future. You get clear on where you're headed, the direction you want to go and what it is you want in your life. Because if you want to create something in the physical world, it takes something, you have to build it, take some time. And so from that place, get clear on what you want, then come back to this moment and live here fully, Mm -hmm. not being in your head, which is being in the past or being in the future, which we'll Mm -hmm. get to in a little while. Mm-hmm. But after my dad passed away, I remember being at his wake and it was open casket. And I sat, it was five and a half hours. And I sat, I stood by that casket and shook every single person's hand. And over 7,000 people came. And almost everyone wow. told me, your dad saved my life. Wow. And not only was I deeply humbled by that, but I saw people from every walk of life, every color, every country, religions, all these different things And I saw how much love they had for him. And it was a reflection of the love that he had for them. And I thought, wow, that's a way to be. Like, that's a way to be with people. Where some of these people knew him for decades, and some of these people only only knew him for a couple months, but he impacted them by his presence. Something that Mm -hmm. every single thing that's pretty much going to create that for you. So so keeping it in mind. Mm -hmm. And also just balancing the macro, the vision, the goal, with the micro, the day to day. I find that oftentimes we can get discouraged if we're not careful. Because if we get so lost in the macro, in the vision, it turns into, well, I'm not there yet. And when we feel I'm not there yet, I'm not there yet, I'm not there yet, day after day after day, it can get discouraging. And mm-hmm. courage comes from cur, which is Latin for heart. So discouraging is like di- being disheartened. But if you have the plan, you've got the vision, you have the macro, but you focus just on the micro. You focus on where am I at right now and how can I win the day? Excuse me. If you just did that, I feel like most of your life, if not your whole life actually, would change. And so that's the number one perspective. Yeah. Okay. If I could just, the, the word gratitude just keeps coming to mind uh, as you talk about perspective in particular, because if you are, if you, if you have, an ad, uh, the, the perspective of that I, that I am so lucky to get to wake up today and do this thing called life. Mm. And you, you've you got the Steve Jobs attitude of like, I'm going to make sure that this is what I want to be doing with my life. Like, this is what I would be choosing if it was the last day of my life. You are by default setting yourself up for to be in a state of gratitude just by by the nature of your choice of of, of your perspective. Uh, you're, you're naturally choosing gratitude, which is a really powerful place to come from when you're in the business of manifesting 
big things uh, or, or little things for that matter, like whatever you're up to being in a place of gratitude for, for what is yet to come, which is also known as faith, uh, you know, is, is a wonderfully powerful place to be. Love that, man. Thank yeah. you. I agree completely. So number two for everyone listening and watching is mastering your day. And when it comes to mastering your day, there's three aspects to that that I'm going to share with you. The, we're going to begin with two of them. And then once I explain those two, we'll get into the third one. Two ideas, deep work and time blocking. I'm going to begin with time blocking. And some of you may have been familiar with this. Maybe you've heard of it. And maybe you do it this way. Maybe you do it a different way. The way that I have found to be is so um, effective is imagine your, your work day. You can do your whole day. But let's say your work is broken up into 60-minute blocks, so one-hour blocks. And with each block, you set an intention and you say, okay, what would I love to accomplish in this hour? Now, in that 60-minute block, you're going to work 45 to 50 minutes. And in those 45 or 50 minutes, whatever your intention was, you do that. And then at the end of those 45 to 50 minutes, take a minute or two and reflect. How'd I do? You know, how was that experience? Did I get done everything I said I wanted to get done? If I didn't, do I want to move that over to my next block or do I want to schedule this in to finish it at a later time? And then you an actual 10 minute true break. That doesn't mean if you're sitting on your computer doing work for the 45 minutes that your break is, let me check some email. That means let me get some water. Let me get outside, get some fresh air. Let me move my body. Let me stretch. Something that completely takes your mind off whatever you're doing. Now, let's say you take that time blocking strategy and you combine it with deep work, meaning we live in a distracted world. And this is what I was alluding to earlier. Most of us live these distracted lives. We take a break from the distraction to be focused in for short periods of time. My, my invitation to you is flip that, spend your life focused, mm -hmm. and then take breaks from the focus to distract yourself. Mm -hmm. And just by flipping that, notice how these two synergize. You get really clear for yourself, okay, what's, I have block one, it's 7 a.m., it's 6 a.m., it's 8 a.m., it's 9, whatever you start, your start time is. I have this block and I want to accomplish A, whatever that is. And then you say, okay, the deep work side of it is I'm going to, if I'm not using my phone, phone's on airplane mode. If I'm on, not using my email, email's off. Sound is off. Notifications are off. I'm eliminating as many distractions as I possibly can so that I can really, really focus. Mm -hmm. And then from that place, when the 45 to 50 minute timer goes off that you set, you will have done more in that 45 to 50 minutes than you normally do probably in three hours. If you live the life most people live, which is coming from this distracted place. Mm -hmm. Now imagine you do those 45 to 50 minutes, you reflect, you take your break, you start again, you set your intention, you do it, you reflect, you take your break. If you were to do that four to eight times a day, your entire professional life, which you don't really do something like that. And so that's what mm -hmm. I mean by combining deep work and time blocking to master your day. And you might ask, well, how do I know what to do in, in my time block? How do I know that? And there is a tool I want to share with you here called, called an Eisenhower matrix. For anyone watching this on YouTube, you'll see that on the screen. For anyone listening, just imagine a four quadrant grid. So you, you draw the cross and you got the top two and you have the bottom two. And so in this, it's called an Eisenhower matrix. And this is a tool that I learned from Stephen Covey, the guy who wrote um, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And I also kind of modified it and added my own kind of flair to it. And so every night before you go to bed, let's say you, you keep a to-do list and you say, what would I love to accomplish tomorrow? What needs to get done? And maybe you've got three things on there, five things on there. Maybe there's 10 or more things on there, but you write them all out. And what you're going to do is you're going to classify them and categorize them. Which quadrant do they fall into? Hmm. Quadrant one are things that are important and urgent. So if it's important and urgent, to me, what that means is you do it and you do it now. This is top priority. Why are you putting it off? Like this is top priority, schedule it, get it done today. Mm -hmm. Or it could be quadrant two. Quadrant two are things that are important and they're not urgent. These are things that, in my opinion, you want to schedule. And mm -hmm. this is the reason. If you're on your computer as an uh, imagining it and you got 50 windows opened and minimized, you're not looking at them, but 
all of those windows are slowing your computer down because your computer needs to process all of those. And think of your brain in the same way. If you went to the grocery store and I asked you to get a hundred different things, but there was no list, I asked you to, you have to re remember it. And there you are in the store, like hoping you don't forget anything. And you're trying to keep it all in your head and you're looking at this and you're looking at that. And then maybe a friend of yours shows up and says, Hey, I lost my, uh, uh, I got a new phone number, by the way. Here it you're not going to want to try to remember seven digits right now. <laughs> or 10 if you count an area code, <laughs> when you've got a hundred food items, you're trying to remember. But the moment you have a list and you don't have to remember anything, you just mm -hmm. need the paper. It's like you just closed all the windows that you had minimized. Mm -hmm. You just freed up so much space, so much mental bandwidth. So in that same way, if you think you have 10 things to do today, <clears throat> but let's say two to five of them or more are important, but they're not urgent. They don't need to get done today. It could be tomorrow. It could be next week. It could be whenever. At that point, I would schedule it because once you schedule it, it's out of your mind for today. You don't mm -hmm. have to think about it anymore. Number three, on the bottom left of the quadrant for those listening, things that are not important, but they're urgent. For these kind of things, if you have a team or an assistant or something like that, I would delegate these things. Because if you have the opportunity to, you shouldn't be doing these. Now, if you don't have a team and it is on you, you only do quadrant three, bottom left, not important and urgent. Once quadrant one, important and urgent on the top left are complete. And the final quadrant are things that are not important and not urgent. So if you're categorizing something as this isn't important, it doesn't really matter, and it's not urgent, I would question why you're doing it in the first place and see if you can just eliminate that from your life. But if it is something that you don't deem it important, but it does need to be done by your own admission, you only do it once quadrant one and three are complete. And so the reason why I have found this to be so valuable, most people treat these quadrants equally. The problem with that is if you've got 10 things to do and only two or three of them are important and urgent and actually need to get done today, but you treat all of them the same, there's going to be moments where something that is due next week, you're working on now, and then you're all proud of yourself because you got it done, but you didn't get done the thing that's due today. Or there's something that's not actually important and non-urgent, and it might not even belong in your life anymore, and yet you're doing that instead of doing the thing that's actually due today because you think they're all the same. And at the end of the day, you were busy, you did a lot, but you weren't productive. The things that you did didn't actually make a difference. And so just creating a system like this and again, to put it all together, the night before, what do I want to accomplish tomorrow? You put it in these quadrants. And then when you do your time blocking, you only time block the important and urgent. If you've got eight of those, that's your whole day. But if you've got two, three, or four, that's going to be two, three, or four of your time blocks. And then you schedule, you delegate, and or you complete whatever's left. Just doing that and then eliminating distraction. I have seen this work miracles for people. and. Anytime that I share this with people, this has been something that's been very valuable to them. And so this is a way that I have found to master your day and your productivity. Mm. As we get to the third, I call this the magic formula for creating anything that you want. And many people are listening going, I want to know what that is. You know? <laughs> and it's something that it is not too good to be true. It is as powerful as it sounds. And yet it, is, it seems very simple. And it's not something you probably haven't heard before. The magic formula for creating anything you want is get committed. One of my mentors has a beautiful quote where he says, failure to commit is the high cost of low living. Mm. Really let that sit in. Failure to commit is the high cost of low living. Kate, if you could share with me and for the listeners, just in your opinion, what is the difference between being interested in something and being committed? Yeah, it's fundamental, and and uh, it's, it's a it's a distinction that I made with uh, an employee or two in the past. Actually, um, you know, it, being interested is you're going to show up, and you're going to be curious, and you're going to maybe ask some questions, and and you're going to you know you're going to dip your toe in a little bit, and you're going to you're going to say things like, "Oh, that's really interesting," and. And whereas being committed, you're going to show up and, and, and damn it, this is mine. I'm going to do whatever it takes to make it. So, 
and nothing's going to stop me and no questions need to be asked. Like it, it's a night and day difference in mindset. Yeah. Beautifully said. And, and to add to it, think about the difference between interested. Yeah. You know, it sounds good. And if it's easy and comfortable, if I'm not too busy, if mm-hmm. I feel like it in the moment, I might consider doing it. it what are you going to do with that? And then committed is I'm doing it. You know, like period, you know, like this is happening. This matters to me. This is important. Yeah. yeah. And so I, anyone who's listening and taking notes, I want you to consider, I make a distinction between the language of commitment Versus the language of hesitation. Mm-hmm. Language of hesitation, maybe, I'll try, we'll see, if I'm lucky, hopefully. There's a lot of room for this not happening. The language of commitment is yes, absolutely, you can mm-hmm. count on me. Yeah. Like, you know, like it's done. Yeah. Now, as an example, everyone listening, imagine I lived somewhat close to you and we're friends. And you give me a call tonight at 8 p.m. And you say, hey, Jamil, sorry for the last minute request, but can you take me to the airport tomorrow morning? And I say to you, what time? And you go, well, uh, I need to be there at 6 a.m. And I look at you and I go, oof, uh, you know, it's possible. Um, I'll see how I feel in the morning. Yep. And then we get off the phone. (laughs) Like, I've had that. (laughs) I've had that. I've had it. Yeah. And, you know, you get off the call and maybe someone that maybe a partner, maybe a friend, you're talking to somebody and they go, so is Jamil taking you to the airport? The only thing you can say is, I don't know. Don't know. Like he's, he's going to see how he feels in the morning. You see, he said it's possible. <laughs> it's like, what does that mean? And so at that point, you're going to have to go call somebody else because you're going to make the assumption that I'm probably not going to come through in the morning. Yeah. Cause you can't count on that. And so you call five other people, you figure it out. And then it's like, all right, screw him. Like <laughs> you didn't help me out. But imagine if you called me and I said, what time? And you said, I need to leave. I need to be there at six. And I say, how far is the airport? And you go 15 minutes. And I say, I'll be at your house five 15 right in the front music blasting with, with a cup of coffee for you. <laughs> at that level, you sit there going, all right, awesome. Like I can count on you. Yeah. And in that same way, for anyone who's listening, let's say another fun example, let's say you're married and you imagine when you were at your ceremony and let's say you said some really beautiful things and then you said, I do. And your partner looks at you and they say, I'll try. (laughs) And I, and my, my, the reason why I think, yeah, yeah. The reason why I think you laughed and why every, every time I say that people laugh, It's because deep down intuitively, we know that's not going to work. We know, what do you mean? I'll try, you know, the whole thing in the vows for better or for worse, sickness and poor, the whole point being, we're going to make this work as well as we possibly can, unless we really both, you know, don't want to. But the point being, if it's getting uncomfortable and it's getting challenging, that doesn't mean, I guess it's not working. It means we're both committed to this. Let's find a way to really make this happen. And so again, if right off the get go, it's I'll try, there's not that commitment. Right. And so something to really keep in mind and ask yourself, what are the things that I want as a father, as a mother, as a husband, as a wife, as a child of my parents, as a friend, as a leader, as a mentor, and all these different roles that you're in as a business partner, what do I want? And my promise is if you raise your level of commitment, you raise your level of engagement, you fully dive into it and you put in more of you to it, it will improve. There's a beautiful story of JFK, uh, you know, the old president, when he was a kid, he went to this private school and they had a uniform and part of the uniform was this little hat. And as he would walk to school and walk back, there was this giant wall that him and his friends would walk by and they would always try to climb it. And none of them were able to do it. It was a fairly complicated wall, apparently. And they all created this belief. It's impossible. Like nobody can climb this wall. And what ends up happening one day is as he's walking by the wall with his friends, they dare him. I bet you can't like climb over that wall. He looks at the wall, he takes his hat and he throws it over the wall. Now, why would he do that? He does that because he knows my mom will kill me if I come home without that hat. (laughs) So because he knows that, he has to find a way over that wall. 
So as he's climbing the wall and it starts to get uncomfortable, it starts to get the hard part. It's, oh yeah, I've never been able to get past this part. I have to find a way. My hat's over there. I can't come home without it. He found a way over the wall. Mm-hmm. And the, the relatability there in your own life, there are things in your life right now that you would love to do, but you create a condition, you create rules rather about why you can't. You label it as impossible. I can't, it can't be done for all these reasons. And then so when you get, uh, when you brush up against the difficult side of it, when it gets hard, when you get knocked down, you quit because you buy the story about why you can't do it. But using the JFK example, where can you throw your hat over the wall? Where can you push through and break through the barrier? And just what's coming to mind right now, Tate, is the whole David Goggins kind of thing. But where mm-hmm. can you break through that barrier and realize these new heights? both metaphorically, you know, you're getting higher over the wall, but in your own life, you're creating much better results. You know, I look at this as the magic of really being all in. The fourth principle is the question, where am I creating from? I have a picture here, for those who can't see, of Albert Einstein, where he said, a problem can't be solved with the same level of thinking that created it. Now, I want you to consider and think about Have you ever noticed that when you're frustrated, when you're pissed off, when you're sad, when you're depressed, when you're fearful, and any other emotions like that, that you're not as resourceful, you're not as creative, and you have a harder time finding solutions to your problems? Yeah. And yeah, and if you're anybody like I've ever met, (laughs) the answer is yes to that. And I find the reason is because from that level of anger and depression and fear and sadness and all these other things, you're operating at the level of the problem. And when you operate from the level of the problem, you can't see or find the solution because it doesn't exist there. Like Einstein says, you can't solve it with the same level of thinking or at the same level that created it. So you also, say, right. I, I'm sorry. I've also heard it said that you're 30% more intelligent when you're in a better mood. Mm, yeah. Heard that, heard that recently. No, I would absolutely believe that and agree with that. And that goes with it too. You're more resourceful when you're in that better emotional state. Mm-hmm. And so then you might say, all right, well, if the solution is not found in this emotion that I'm in, where do I find it? What do I do? And what you do to keep it simple first is you keep yourself at a high emotional and energetic state to optimize your performance. And you might say, all right, well, how do I do that? And you, my response is you tune yourself. Now, I have this metaphor that I love that I came up with years ago of a radio. Now, I have a picture here of a radio for anyone who's watching this. But imagine your car radio. Now, when you're listening to the radio, what station do you hear? The station you hear is the one you're tuned into. And that's the only one you hear. Mm -hmm. Now, do the other radio stations cease to exist because you're not tuned into them? It's like, no, they're always there. They're always available simultaneously for you to just change to at any moment, whenever you want. Mm -hmm. Now, emotions work the same way. Your emotions come from inside of you never outside of you. And so when you know that, then how do you tune yourself? The knobs, let's say, on the radio dial of you is your focus. It's your attention. It's your thoughts. It's what you listen to, what you believe, what you buy into. So imagine here you are on this metaphorical highway of life driving down and you're tuned into Misery FM. And that's the radio station that you've been listening to for years. Like maybe that's the one, that's the only one you know. Like you don't even know there's other ones available. And then somebody you windows closed but they look like they're having a great time you don't know and you're like i don't understand like how are they listening to this station and feeling that happy and what you don't realize is they're not listening to that station and the moment you change the radio station let's say from misery fm to gratitude fm as a little kind of flashback to what we talked about with perspective Mm -hmm. wow i woke up today wow 150,000 people didn't Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. And wow, I have this opportunity today to create something in my life, to build something, to do something for the people I care about, to make something of myself, to do whatever the case may be, to relax, whatever it is you want to do. Just that gratitude FM. Wow, look what's going on in my life right now that I can appreciate, that I can love, that I can be thankful for. Immediately, the misery shifts. You're not miserable because of what's happening. You're miserable because of what you think and believe about what's happening. It's the Mm -hmm. meaning that we grant to the experience. And oftentimes we project it out. We give away our power and we say, I feel what I feel 
because so-and-so did this, so-and-so said that, the economy is like this. And those are legitimate circumstances, those are situations, those happened. But that is not why you feel what you feel. That's why you're telling yourself you feel what you feel. But your emotions always come from you and the story you tell yourself. And one way you know that, as an example, is somebody in your life that you really love. And you could say, this person makes me happy. Well, I could respond to that and say, do they always make you happy? Hmm. And you might say, well, no, there's times where they frustrate me. There's times where I feel like sad about it. There's times where I'm angry with them. Interesting. Because if they made you happy, if they were the source, then you'd always be happy around them. But the happiness doesn't come from them. It's coming from you. And it's you giving yourself permission to experience it while being in their presence. Mm -hmm. If it's raining outside and you, and I'm really angry and you ask me, why are you so angry? And I say, because it's raining, like the rain is causing my anger. But then somebody up the street, and if you ask them why, and they say, it's raining outside. Like, I love when it rains. I get to go play in the puddles. I get to do all this stuff. How is it that the rain is causing one person to be happy and one person to be angry? It's not. <laughs> Water falling from the sky doesn't have that power. Mm -hmm. But the person who loves the rain, it's because that story. Oh, you know, the most precious resource on the planet is falling from the sky. My plants are getting watered. I'm going to go jump in a puddle somewhere. And they enjoy that. The other person is thinking, oh, my God, my plans are ruined. Like, it's going to flood or something. And that story is going to create the misery, let's say. And so, mm -hmm. again, always coming back to how, wh what am I focusing on, which is basically me tuning into a certain station. You can always find what's wrong, but you can also always find what's right. And when you recognize that, you are so much more creative when solving your problems. So, again, where am I creating from is the principle we just talked about. And there's two ways to see the world, which we were just kind of alluding to. You can see the world through the lens of deficiency. You're looking for what's wrong, what's missing, what's bad, what's broken, what's not working, what's not enough. This would be a way of tuning yourself to Misery FM and any of these other radio stations that you don't really want to listen to. Mm -hmm. Or you can look at life through the lens of appreciation. What is working? What is great about this? What am I grateful for? Maybe there's a hardship going on, but what's the lesson? How can... You know, I, I used to I share with Tate sometimes, you know, no pressure, no diamonds. Like, how am I, how is my sword being sharpened by this hardship right now? What's the opportunity here? This has nothing to do with positive thinking. This has nothing to do with head in the clouds. Like, you're not looking at reality. This has to do with you genuinely taking this powerful stance of neutrality and say, you know what? A situation is happening right now. I'm not going to label it as bad. A situation is happening and I get to choose what this means. Is it an opportunity for me to grow? Or is this like the worst thing that could have ever happened to me? And I'm going to feel whichever one I choose. So it's not better or worse or right or wrong. It's what is it you'd love to feel? And then what can you focus on? And what story can you start telling yourself to step into that? And remember, again, we find what we're looking for. No matter what's happening around you, you always have the power to create an experience of life that's useful for you. And again, you do that with your focus, with your attention, with the meaning that you give to your experience. And I call this reality creation. We're doing it all the time. And now you might as well do it intentionally, deliberately. Most yeah. of it, we do this all the time, but most yeah. of us do it unconsciously. Yeah. That's huge right there, guys. Like just consider that you are creating your own reality in some form or fashion all the time. So because we're doing that, we get to do that. We get to be aware of it, right? Like we can choose to be aware of it and, and therefore be in charge of it ultimately. Like that's what this work is, is ultimately about. And it's, you know, it says right there, reality creation is, is what we're doing all the time by assigning meaning to the events and the circumstances of our lives. Like that's it in a nutshell. And it really comes down to this appreciation lens versus this deficiency lens that you see life through. Is it a scarcity mentality or is it abundance mentality? That's another way of looking at this. Like, is life showing up for you or is life showing up to, you know, to do things to you or to be for you to be a victim of, right? Like it's all, if that's your choice, that's a hundred percent your choice. Yeah. And to your point, just so everyone is listening, whenever I share something like this, I never share it from a, from a place of judgment or blame. Mm -hmm. As Tate said, it's your choice. Yeah. From a place of responsibility, meaning 
I have the ability to respond to my life circumstances. If I don't like it, I'm the creator of my reality. I get to do something about that and change it to whatever it is I want it to be. But if I come more from the victim place and saying life is happening to me, then I can't feel better until life changes. Mm -hmm. But the nature of life, life changes when you do. <laughs> so mm -hmm. you have to go first. Yeah. And that, and just something that once we're willing to do that, our whole experience of life changes fast. Yeah. Yeah. The fifth principle I want to share with you, there's two ways to create your future. You can create your future from the past, or you can create your future from the future. Mm -hmm. Here's the strategy that unconsciously most people do. This is my life over here in my past. This is what it's been up until this point. This is how I've been, how I've acted. This has been my, my skill level. This is the things that I've been comfortable with that I've tried. This is what people said I'm capable of and what I'm good enough to do. And this is just the way, this is the results that I've created up until this point. And I take that and I say, well, you know, tomorrow is probably going to be a lot like today. And so what I do is I take what's in my past and I put it into my future. Mm -hmm. And now I live into it and I keep acting the same way. I keep mm -hmm. being the same version of me. Mm -hmm. And from that place, tomorrow looks a lot like yesterday because you haven't changed. Yeah. You're still operating from this self-fulfilling prophecy of, well, I'm, I've always never been good enough to do that thing that I've always wanted to do. So I'm probably going to continue not to be good enough. So you don't try. And because you don't try, you stay not good enough and then nothing happens. That's unfortunately, that's where most people play. And again, mm -hmm. not a judgment. It's just an observation that I've seen time and time and time again. But again, once you step into the ownership, the creator space, and you recognize it, you can do differently. So now you might say, well, what's the alternative? You create the future from the future. Maybe you close your eyes and you visualize what it is you really would love. Or you get a pen and paper, you journal it out. What future would I love? How would I be in my future? How would I treat people? How would I treat my partner, my spouse? How would I go on dates with people? How would I be at work? How would I be with my team? What opportunities would I take a chance with? You know, how would I approach fearful situations? When I'm afraid, what would I do with that? How would I bust through that opposed to let it hold me back? You get clear on all these things. You can do a week, a month, a year, a decade, a whole lifetime, whatever you want to do when you play with it. But you get clear, who would I be being? And then what you do is you come back to this moment and you recognize that a goal isn't a place to get to. A goal is a place to come from. Mm. Your goal will be created based on who you're being. When you are being the version of you that's capable of creating that goal, you will. When you're not being that version of you, it is impossible for you to create that goal. And so from this place, you get really clear, okay, for those of you who are seeing me visually, and I'll do my best to describe it for those listening, I've got my right hand fingers really stretched out probably like seven inches long or something. And from this place, that's, that's representative of big me, that version of me in the future that has everything that I want. Mm -hmm. And then present moment me, let's say is little me. This is like an inch. And this little version of me looks into the future and sees who am I being when I'm being big me. And then you come back to this moment. And when you come back to this moment and you're being that version of you now, it's not fake it till you make it. It's be it until you see it. And by being it now, over time, this little version of you grows and it grows and it grows and it grows. And eventually you step into and realize the results and all the rewards that come with you being that bigger version of you. And so again, not fake it till you make it. There's no inauthenticity here. It's be it until you see it. And this is I why you that. can be it. Love that. Yeah. And the reason why you can be it, and this is where a lot of people get caught up, the past and the future don't exist. The past and the future are just concepts. The past only exists in your memory, and the future only exists in imagination. Mm -hmm. You only ever have this moment right now. And so by you getting really clear, who do I want to be, and what would it look like, and how would I act, and all these things, and you see it in your mind's eye, that, think of that like the recipe, as if you were making something in the kitchen. That's the recipe of who you need to be. So that means you know how to do it. So now start doing it, like be it now, because if you're waiting for the future to be it, that's never going to happen because the future doesn't exist. You create the future by who you decide to be in this moment. Yeah. And so you get to decide, who do I want to be? 
and by you consistently creating your future from your future. It doesn't matter what happened in, in the past. It doesn't matter what happened yesterday. It doesn't matter any failures and setbacks and times where you thought you weren't good enough. It doesn't even matter the successes you had in the past. They're not happening right now. So given what you want, who do you need to be? And then be that version of you now, and you will realize that so much faster. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. And so as we get to number six, I call this pressure. Is it your friend or is it your foe? Something that I'd like you to write down. Anyone who's uh, taking notes on this, and if you're going to go back, please take notes on it. Your performance is equal to your potential minus your interference. Performance equals potential minus interference. And we all have infinite potential. I like to think of it as there's who you're capable of being, and, there's, and that's like a 10 out of 10, and there's who you're actually being. And for most of us, most of the time, we play somewhere between like three and seven. Most of the time, in some areas, maybe you're rocking an eight, nine, or 10, but across the board, we're usually not doing that. Across the board, we have these sevens, and we think we're playing at a 10. And just like with the JFK kind of metaphor, hat over the wall, where are you creating that glass ceiling? Where are you deluding yourself into thinking, I'm freaking amazing, and I'm rocking a nine or a 10, when you're really rocking a two compared to what you're capable of? When you think you're at a 10 and you're not, and you're not being honest with yourself, you create the glass ceiling where you can't bust through it because you think you've arrived, you think you're there. And so if we have this infinite potential, something seems to be getting in the way. So then the question becomes, what is getting in the way? And the answer is interference. So if you want to improve performance, you want to limit interference. So you might say, well, what does that mean? Like, what, well, give me an example of interference. And there's a few that I'll share with you. The first that I found over and over again in my own life back in the day, and especially with a lot of the people that I've worked with over the years, self-consciousness. Mm. When you have increased self-consciousness, that is you getting in your own way. Yeah. And the example that I'd like to share with you is I remember the first time I spoke in public to a, uh, not in general, like when I was, you know, two or something, but then when I spoke to a crowd of people <laughs> and there was uh, 200 people there and I was going to be speaking to them for 10 minutes. And I was initially nervous about that. And then I, you know, I prepared, I prepared, I knew my stuff. I had it down cold. The presentation is going to be tomorrow. And there I am in my Arizona apartment. I got my Ikea futon <laughs> and I'm staring at this futon and I say, okay, I've just rehearsed this 20 times. I got it. I have it down cold and I want to make sure that I don't make any mistakes. I want to practice this again. I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to look at this futon and I'm going to imagine 200 people on this couch staring at me. And from that place, I sat there, I sat with it. I, I saw it in my mind and I said, okay, here we go open my eyes. I see all these people staring at me. I start what I had just done 10, 20 times, no issue at all. Within seconds, heart starts pounding. My hands are sweating. I forgot the whole thing. Now, I'm the only person in the room. The couch is empty. Why did that happen? It happened because the brain doesn't know the difference between what you imagine and what you actually create, what you actually experience rather. And so because of that, I triggered myself to go into this stress response, this fight or flight response, just based on my imagination. Notice that so many of, of the people listening you do that all the time. And because if you're coming from a place of not being conscious of it, you think it's because of all those people. Clearly it's not because nobody's in the room with me and I'm experiencing it, right? I'm imagining it in that same way. No one's causing your stress. You are. <laughs> and so when I realized that, and I was like, wow, this is amazing. I sat with it. I'm like, all right, I calmed down. I saw them on the couch again, and I got comfortable with it. Anyone watching me from like the balcony window probably thought I was crazy. I'm pointing to the wall. I'm, I'm, I'm yelling at people that aren't there. I'm, I'm having fun with it. And after doing that five, 10 times, it was wonderful. The next day I went in there and I crushed it. And people came up after and they said, wow, like that was amazing. How many times have you done this before? And well, in reality, if you want to call it that, I've never done it before. But in my felt experience, I've done it like 50 to 100 times <laughs> because I've done it in my mind. And so all high performers do something, not all, but virtually all, many of them, they do something called mental rehearsal. You get really clear, visualizing what would successfully completing whatever it is I'm about to do look like. 
I have the business meeting, I have the closing in the real estate deal, I've got the whatever I'm about to do, and then see it going well. But then also take it a step further, see it not going well, and then see yourself still coming through successfully, finding a way to figure it out, finding a way to handle it. When you do something like that, it is incredible how you show up. And so when it comes to increasing self-consciousness being the problem, it's because you're thinking about yourself instead of thinking about what you're doing. Mm. When you make it about other people, when you make it about the team, when you make it about the impact that you're having, it gets so much easier. So my recommendation to decrease the interference from your self-consciousness, get off self and get on your purpose or get on others, how they're going to benefit. Again, the stories you tell yourself, you might say, what will it mean about me if this thing happens? Oh, it'll mean I'm a failure. It means I'm not good enough. It means my dad was always right because when I was a kid, he said A, B, and C. And these are just stories that we tell ourselves 20 years later, 30 years later, that create so much interference for us. You know, if this happens, I'm screwed. My career is over. I'll never bounce back from this. It's not true. But if you believe it, it becomes true for you. And then again, remembering increased pressure increases your tension. And as tension goes up, high performance goes down. And I said in the beginning, well, where can pressure be your friend? And pressure can be your friend, in my opinion, if you're the kind of person that tells yourself, I thrive on pressure. But with that, you actually feel good when you're under pressure. You feel like you're in the zone. You feel like you're in a flow state. You love it. Awesome. Pressure is great for you. But you might tell yourself you like pressure, but if tension's going up and you feel it in your body and you're in that fight or flight kind of stress response, it's not supporting you. So start getting off yourself, getting on purpose, getting on others, and shift the stories of what you're telling yourself it'll mean if it goes badly. Because again, you're scaring yourself and it's not true. And again, being overly hard, being overly hard on yourself, self-critical, judgmental, it's not only not conducive to peak performance, but beating yourself just slows you down. Beating yourself like that is not going to help. And identifying, where can I improve and make the necessary changes to that as best as you can? Number seven, as we begin to wrap up, is what I call performance necessity. Performance necessity is basically you having a reason to get what you want. You having a reason to perform at the level that you say you want to perform at. I find that when you lose your motivation, you've lost connection to why you're doing it. And when you consider that, the connection is not just mental, it's emotional too. Now, most of us don't ever lose track of the mental reason why we're doing it. I could say, why do you do what you do? And you can give me a great essay. You can give me an answer. You can give me a response that sounds good. But if you're still not feeling the motivation, if you still feel like you lost it, in my opinion, it's because you've disconnected from your heart. You've disconnected from the emotional reason of why it's important to you, of mm. why it matters. And this ties into the second aspect of increasing performance necessity. You can ask yourself, who is counting on me? Maybe it's a partner that you currently have. Maybe it's a partner that you haven't met yet that will count on you in the future. Maybe it's kids. Maybe it's parents. Maybe it's teams. Maybe it's your business partner. Who is counting on you? Mm -hmm. How will their life improve when you succeed? And why do you, quote unquote, have to succeed. When you make it from this place of, wow, it's not just me. I said in the beginning, leaders are people that make it about we. I want to make an impact. I want to make a difference. Anyone who's got performance necessity, imagine like I'm imagining like an, an athlete in the Olympics. They're not just thinking about, oh yeah, like I can't mess up because I don't want to look bad or something like that. They're thinking, my country is counting on me. Like mm -hmm. I represent my whole country. That brings forth when they're training, I'm going to give it everything I got. I'm not going to hold back because my whole country is counting on me. There I am. Like I'm imagining I'm, I'm, a, I'm a track guy. I'm imagining back in like the days Usain Bolt is running Jamaica. They had their athletes and you know, it's a relatively small country and they were so proud of their athletes. And there's like dancing in the streets and parades. And it was awesome every time like they won. So imagine being one of those athletes and there you are training and there you are like jogging through the neighborhood and everyone's waving at you because they're so excited to see you on TV represent the country in like a month or two months or three months. That's going to do something to you. Imagine you have kids in the future. Maybe you have a spouse in the future. You have a partner, you have your team, whatever it is, people are counting on you. And when you can come from that place, you don't give up. And when you come from that place, you push yourself so much more. And I, I just find that to be 
really useful. Number eight, I call it the cure for overwhelm. Oftentimes people will feel overwhelmed and they'll say, what do I do? Like, how do I get out of this? This is one perspective on how to do that. Ask yourself, how am I spending my energy? For many of us, for those who can't see this, if you're listening, I have two circles here. On the left, the left circle's got 10 arrows coming out of it. Now these arrows, let's say you had 100 points every day of energy that you could disperse into all the things you wanted to do. Many of us, going back to deep work, we live this distracted life. So you've got 10 points in 10 different things. That's, what, that's why there's 10 arrows there. Excuse me. And from this place, you are doing a lot. You're running around like a chicken without a head. You're real busy. The problem is you're spreading yourself too thin, so you're not actually creating a lot of results. And then you get frustrated because you go, I'm exhausted. I'm burning myself out here, and I don't really have much to show for it. And I found that that is not conducive to creating this high performance that you're looking for. So you might say, what's the alternative? On the right side, that circle, there's one giant arrow where you put all 100 points of your energy into that one thing because I found it's far more effective and efficient to do one thing at a time 10 times than to try to do 10 things at once. Mm -hmm. People delude themselves into thinking, I'm a multitasker. Multitasking only really works on things that aren't that important relative to your performance, meaning you can chew bubble gum and walk. You can have a phone conversation and walk, but you can't do brain surgery while you're trying to have a conversation in Italian and you don't, you're not fluent in the language. You know, it's like that doesn't work because you're, you can't multi-focus. You can only do one thing at a time. And neuroscience proves this. Anyone who thinks they're multitasking, you're really just shifting your focus very rapidly. And the problem with that, going back to living this distracted life, every time you shift from A to B to B to C to C to D, you lose all of the momentum that you had built up in your focus in that flow in, let's say, A. So you went from A to B, and now you got to start over. Yeah. And then when you go from B to C, you have to start over. So you're never actually getting to that like breaking point where you're really performing at a high level. You never enter that flow state. And so yeah. when you ask yourself, what is the cure for overwhelm? One thing at a time, because you only ever have one thing to do. And here's the secret. The only thing you ever have to do is the thing that's in front of you. Yeah. When you're time blocking and you got those five, eight, 10 things, why are you worried about time block seven when you're on time block two? Right. Do time block two. Do yeah. whatever it is that's right in front of you. And if you just did that, again, you'd be so much more effective and efficient. You get so much more out of your life. I yeah. like to think of it like the, met, uh, like the distinction between a laser and a light bulb. Yeah. A light bulb shines bright, but the light is dispersed. It's kind of like it's bright, but it's weak. A laser, it's, co it's concentrated, condensed energy in that beam form, really narrow. It's not lighting up a room, yeah. but it'll light something on fire. Yeah. Now, why can it do that? And it, it's doing that because it's concentrated. It's, it's condensed. Focused. Yeah. Yeah. And in physics, power is the difference something makes in the amount of time that it takes. So mm. the bigger the difference in the shorter period of time, the more power. And that's the same thing with that laser. It's the same thing with you. When you take that laser of your focus and you put it into one thing at a time, you know, oftentimes people ask me, what can I add into my life? Sometimes there are things to add into your life, but oftentimes a better question is what can I subtract? What doesn't belong in my life anymore? What is actually, um, it doesn't, it served me in the past. It doesn't serve me now. It's actually an anchor right now. And it's slowing me down. It could be a person. It could be uh, something that you do on a daily basis could be something in your environment, but what doesn't belong anymore? Cut that away so you can make room for what actually does belong there now. Mm -hmm. I got to mention the book Deep Work to by Cal Newport. Uh, just such a great book about specifically what Dr. Jamil was just speaking to, just the power of doing one thing at a time and how much more powerful and effective that is than multitasking. And multitasking is really just a myth. It really is. Like you're you never truly multitasking. You're ultimately doing one thing at a time anyway. <laughs> and yeah. uh you know, so why not do it focused and with power and with laser focus? I love that. Mm, beautiful. Thank you, man. And the, the word focus is going to come up here in this next part. Number nine, the ninth principle to getting the most out of yourself is focus on today. 
I have a picture here of a past client of mine, amazing guy. And he is the Pat, he's the 2018, 2019 world champion Taekwondo American fighter. And like many of you, he has a dream for his future. And in his life, as he was getting close to retiring, he thought, what would I love to experience going forward? And he had a dream of retiring. He wanted to live on a gorgeous island. He wanted to own a vacation home in the West Coast of the U.S. He wants to have a fun and adventure-filled career that he can start after he retires. That's more for fun, but it's really fulfilling. He wants a passionate and loving relationship with his wife. And this was his goals. Now, you might have similar goals. You might say, that sounds great. Sign me up. And you might have your own. Keeping in mind, the key is it won't happen overnight. The key being commit to today and win the day. I mentioned it earlier. Mm -hmm. If you get too focused on the vision, the vision's great to have, but you want to come back to the micro to just this moment by moment and ask yourself, how do I focus on the process? When you focus on the outcome only, you never get there because you're not doing what it takes to create it. But when you focus on the outcome and you're clear on where you're going, and then you come back to this moment and you say, what needs to get done today in this next hour, in this next moment to move me one step further? Mm -hmm. And when you focus on one step further, it's one foot at a time. You know, when I was in Arizona for the five years I lived there, we hiked a lot of mountains. And I remember hearing uh, this quote, it's like a mountaineering quote. They say, never look at the peak. Because this idea being when you look at the peak and it's so far away, especially when you're climbing something that's like 30, or not there, like 22,000 Everest yep. style, like 29,000, you get discouraged if it looks that far away. But if you looked at the peak and said, all right, that's where I'm going. And then you just focused on looking in front of you and said, one foot, one foot, one foot, one foot. Over the course of hours, you turn around and you see, wow, I am so much further along than I was before. And again, just getting discouraged is falling into that trap of thinking that I'm not there yet. I'm so far away versus let me take a look at how far I've come. I'm so much further than I was before. I'm so much further along in the process. And that is something to really feel grateful for. The power of consistency, the people that win in any industry, whoever's listening to this, no matter what you do, the people in, the, in your industry that win stay in the game. Mm -hmm. The people who win in your industry, they don't quit. They don't give up early. If they love it, if they want it to work, they find a way. They yeah. experience the same hardship you do. They get knocked down just like you do, but they don't make it mean I'm not good enough. They don't make it mean failure. They keep showing up. Mm -hmm. And when you keep showing up, life has a way of working for you. And the final principle for today, I call it the fundamentals. And this is where I kind of put on my doctor hat. And this is in order for you to perform at the highest levels, there's a, your body needs to be in a certain level of shape. If you feel like garbage, it's going to impact your mental, your emotional, your spiritual state. And yeah. so from this place, keeping in mind, this isn't medical advice. I would run this by your, your medical healthcare provider. But at the same time, this is what I have found to be some general things that if most people did, a lot of their energy would enhance, brain fog would go away, you would perform better in your creativity and your thought processes, and you'd just be a better leader. Every day, commit to the basics. Number one, water, hydration, drinking. Usually it's half your body weight in ounces. This is bearing in mind if you don't have like kidney issues, any kind of health concerns, run that by your provider if you're not sure. But in general, Half your body weight in ounces is a great place to start. If you're exercising a lot, if you're sweating a lot, doing something like this for yourself goes a long way and including electrolytes, especially if you're sweating. Number two is sleep. Ideally, everyone's different, but that seven to nine hours is that sweet spot for most people and especially going to bed and waking up at around the same time. You have all these clocks in your body, rhythms, they call them. And if you want to work in alignment with the rhythm, with the rhythm, Eight hours and then eight hours, meaning you going to bed at 10 and waking up at six is very different than you going to bed at two and waking up at 10. Even though they're both eight hours, you will feel a lot crappier waking up at 10 a.m. than if you woke up at six, assuming you got the eight hours. Yeah. And they've, they've got neuroscience studies to back that when you're dehydrated and when you're sleeping, let's say less than six hours a night, your performance is equal to that of you being functionally drunk. Yeah. And yeah. so imagine there you are dealing with all this money. There you are dealing with your team, you're dealing with clients and you're drunk. Like that's what you're doing. And it's like, well, if you're committed to your success, why are you doing that? And if you realize, again, no, no blame, no shame, no judgment, but why are you doing that? Like get clear for yourself mm -hmm. and do something about it if you want to.
Mm-hmm. Number three yeah. is nutrition. You know, there is no one way to eat. Everyone's different. But in general, I like, I like the simple quote, eat real food, mostly plants, not too much. What is real food? Real food is the ingredients to your food is food, not chemicals, not long names that you can't pronounce. It's yeah. not highly ultra processed. If you want to eat meat, get some really good quality meat, get some good quality fats, avocados, coconuts, things of that nature, and listen to your body. I tell people there is no such thing as healthy food. There's foods that are healthy for you. There mm-hmm. are certain foods that you eat that you think are healthy and you have a reaction. You get brain fog, you get bloating, you get GI disturbances. That means that food doesn't work for you. And so it doesn't matter that other people think it's healthy. That's not good for you. So just get clear on, listen to my, how do I feel a half hour after I eat, an hour after I eat, tomorrow, like all these kind of things. Avoiding eating and drinking your sugar, drinking your sugar rather. Soda, juice, big offenders. If you eliminate those, goes a long way. Avoiding vegetable oils. And if you stop eating three to four hours before you go to sleep, your mental performance goes through the roof and you sleep so much better. Movement, increase your movement throughout the day. Ideally, you know, people say smoking, sitting is the new smoking. Move your body, resistance training, put on some muscle. That's going to help you as you get older with your bone mass. Stretch, maintain your flexibility, get some sunlight, get some fresh air as often as you can. Little biohack here that's real simple but helpful. Meditation, breath work, and here's a simple breath pattern that you can use. If you're ever in your head, if you're ever feeling worried, you're ever feeling stressed out, anxious, Take a moment, you close your eyes, you could sit or stand, but you take a moment, you close your eyes and you inhale for four seconds through your nose. And once you do that, you exhale through your nose also for six seconds. When the exhalation is longer than the inhalation, you stimulate the parasympathetic, which is that rest relaxation side of your nervous system. And you're actually causing yourself to calm down. Some of you might find four seconds in, six seconds out challenging. So start with that and practice it. Some of you might find it really easy. And if that's the case, switch to a six second in, eight second out. But that's something really simple, powerful that you can use. Have fun. You know, you know who here remembers fun, right? <laughs> There's like, oftentimes we think I'm a professional. I'm a business person. I don't have time for fun. You will perform better when you're playing. You will perform better when you're loving what you're doing. Yeah. You'll perform better when you're enjoying yourself. So incorporate fun, schedule fun into your week because it's as important as the work that you do. Focus on your relationships, whether it's your intimate relationship with your, with your spouse, maybe it's your kids, maybe it's your friends, maybe it's your partners, maybe it's whatever. Meet new people, but build relationships. Humans are social creatures, like really connect, especially after this past year, really connect with people. Don't try to just be on your own. And then if you have a spiritual practice, whatever that is, Deepen it. You believe whatever you want to believe, but whatever helps you feel connected, whatever helps you really feel tapped in, turned on, tuned in, like be that. And as we close here, just some opportunities to dive deeper. I always try to share with people other ways that I can contribute and serve. If uh, this has been valuable, if you've enjoyed this and you like the style, there's other podcasts that I've been on. There's, you know, Four four to 500 videos I've made over the last five to six years that are on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn. You can follow me on those. It's at Dr. Jamil Sayaj, DR, and then my name. And uh, I'll also have all these links given to Tate. And my website, jamilsayaj.com, the book that Tate mentioned, 20 Steps to Your Next Breakthrough. You can get a free copy of that, of the ebook version on the website as well. When I made this, I wanted it to be really practical and powerful, but I wanted it to be simple, quick, easy. I didn't want to give you some 500-page book that gives you every excuse not to read it. The 76-page book, every chapter is like one to three pages on average. You can finish it in an hour or less, or you can take one chapter a day, but it's designed to get you from stuck to being in momentum and creating some quick wins, some quick results as kind of a foundation to step forward. And there's also an audiobook version on the website for a couple bucks if that's more your style. And Ultimately, what it comes down to, you can read things, you can watch things, you can listen to things, and they can be really useful. I've had my life changed by a lot of things like that. But ultimately, don't just have great notes. Don't just sit here and say, that was a good experience. That was powerful. If you don't do anything with it, if you don't take any action, I said earlier, your life doesn't change unless you do first. So my strong recommendation, my loving challenge, be different going forward. You're not the same person you were when we started this. You're completely different. And so from this place, 
let's be different. Let's do different. If you'd like some support with that, if this has resonated with you on the website, you can also book a conversation that's on me, my gift to you. And we'll get clear. What is it that you'd love to experience and create in your life? What do you believe seems to be getting in the way of that? And then let's come up with a plan to help you get there. And if you want to do that with me, awesome. And if you'd rather do that with somebody else or you want to do it on your own, I wish you the best and maybe I can point you in the right direction. But that is what I have for you all today. This has been such a privilege and a pleasure. And as I close here with the last slide, with every decision you recreate yourself, the price of creating your new life and living it is giving up your old one. So really get clear. What do I want? What matters to me going forward? Get any support, help that you think would help you get there faster and take this massive and consistent action until you get there. Course correcting along the way whenever you realize that you're getting off track. And so I want to be the first to welcome you to this next chapter of your life because the rest of your life starts right now. Wow. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Guys, make a choice right now to think of the top three things that you can take away from this last hour or so and write them down either right now or as soon as you can when you're not driving or doing a treadmill. Um, (laughs) uh, And, and, and I mean, there are so many great, great takeaways here. Um, Some really foundational stuff. And if you, you know, take away one of the 10 um, and, and really embrace it. Uh, If it's the physic, if it's your physical health, uh, if it's your spiritual health, what, you know, the, the things that, that you can do to put your foundational wellness in place and, and really take charge, like that's going to be gold for you uh, it, it, for the rest of your life. Like Dr. Jamil just said, uh, welcome to the next chapter in the rest of your life. So, um, that's super exciting stuff. Again, it's, um, Dr. Jamil Syed and it's, uh, it's, uh, J A M I L S A Y E G H Jamil Syed.com is where you can find him. And, uh, like I said, I am a personal client of Dr. Jamil's. Um, Thrilled to be so. It's some of the best work that I've ever done. And I don't say that lightly because I've done a lot of personal development work, a a lot of uh, professional development work. And uh, it's it really truly is uh, transformational stuff, uh, game changing, really. And what's great about coaching, whether it's with Jamil or someone else, is you get to really specifically and intentionally kind of hone in on a specific part of your life or uh, maybe one or two specific parts of your life that you really want to create change and transformation inside of. And you get to really get it like, you know, out of the seven or eight main areas of your life, your physical, spiritual, psychological, uh, you know, financial, et cetera, you, you know, you really get to like improve one of those in a really amazing way. And like the first slide of this presentation was that life can change in an instant and like life can change in an instant in many different ways. And, and if you think about it, it's really the only way that life really changes, you know, a lot of the time. Anyway, um, you meet someone, you fall in love. Well, there's an instant where 30 seconds ago, you didn't know that person. And 30 seconds later you did, and you're interested and all of a sudden things have completely changed and that's how life goes. And, um, you know, I just, (laughs) I just got a a message that came across my computer during our recording about a deal that, you know, we just found like $4 million for, and we're going to end up doing, and it's, this is another deal that's like, wasn't even really on the radar. And it's actually a, two deals and from one seller. And so, um, you know, and that's one of the things that I love about apartment investing is that life can change and does change in an instant with these deals. And uh, some of it's, some of them produce life changing money, whether it's passive cash flow or wealth building or both. It's, uh, it's such an exciting space, but Dr. Jamil, this has been amazing. I am so grateful to you. Um, 
and I know that the listeners are as well. I can't wait to go back and and just digest it all again. And uh, and there's a there's a lot of uh, there's a lot to unpack and a lot of uh, really great things to delve into. So you've given us uh, a, a lot of good challenges here and and a, a lot of great wisdom. And uh, we're super grateful to you. Thank you so much, man. I'm so grateful to you and for everyone who spent the time listening to this, especially if someone's going through this more than once, again, nothing but respect because yep. it's a commitment. And yep. especially, you know, we went a little more than an hour. That's a commitment. I don't take that lightly. If you go through this though, almost as if like the, the metaphor I'm getting is like, you know, back in the day, you're in high school, you're in like middle school or something. People are checking for lice, you know, they have like that comb, yeah. <laughs> you're combing through like this fine comb, all the hair. In that same way, what would happen if you comb through like every second of this presentation? What would happen yeah. if you comb through and you found the little nuggets? You found what is there for you. Again, some of that you're already doing. Some of this stuff you're not. Some of the stuff you're doing and you could do it more. And from mm -hmm. that place, you go, oh, wow, this was the one thing I needed to hear. I do believe things happen for a reason. I don't think you listened to this by accident. I mm -hmm. think there was something here that you were ready to hear at the stage of your life that you're at right now. And you heard it for a reason. But as Tate said, you know, life can change in an instant, but you got to go first. If yeah. you're waiting for life to change, yeah, it's going to change. Of course, that's what life does, but it won't necessarily change in the way you want it to unless you make that happen. Yeah. And continue it. Consider that one of the ways that you can go first is to get coaching. Like that's a, that's a, a wonderful way to ensure, like I looked at when I signed up for coaching, to me, it was like I was buying an insurance policy that I was going to get out of my life what I wanted to get out of my life. And I, and I know that I, for me, it was an insurance policy because I had the knowledge that I knew, I knew that I had the work ethic to make my life happen the way that I want to. And I think I had the resources and, and hopefully at least, you know, a, a portion of the intelligence to do so. I really needed the, like the direction and the second pair of eyes on things. And, and, you know, like Tiger Woods at one point, I think had five or six coaches all at the same time and none of them were better golfers than him. So consider that the best in the world not only get coached, they seek coaching out and they get coached heavily, you know, the very, very best in the world at what they do. And uh, so, you know, and consider that if you're in, a, in this apartment investing space, you're a high level entrepreneurial athlete. Like I look at that. I, that's how I look at this. Like performance is huge and spending this time on the, these 10 aspects of performance and getting more getting more out of you is wow what a what a treat hopefully that you feel like you just did and you know you just um gave yourself uh with the ability to to really delve into and dive into um these these aspects of personal development i would encourage anybody uh and everybody to consider getting a coach like you, it, it's just, it's, it's something that you can't uh, replicate in a friend or a colleague or a partner or a business partner. Um, maybe a mentor is the closest thing that you, you know, somebody that you can has kind of taken you under their wing or that you're working for that's a paid mentor. But uh, you know, a coach is, is, is even different than that. Like a, a coach is going to, is going to really be like in your corner on all levels of life. And, and that to me is uh, it, the holistic approach to this um, thing called life is really where it's at, where, it, you know, the, the concept of intentional congruency is pretty fascinating to me. It's the idea that all parts of your life serve all other parts of your life. And I, and I just, I think that's a Gary Keller concept and, uh, yeah, I, I, I love that. So, so on that guys, this has been, uh, hopefully like drinking from a fire hose. Uh, that that's how, that's how we designed it. Right. Coach. <laughs> yep. 
<laughs> yeah. So, uh, but I, I loved it. I loved every minute of it and uh, can't wait to, it's going to be a, a great episode in the, in the, uh, in the, canon of the apartment guys podcast uh so uh so with that sir thank you again and uh we will circle back with you maybe in a year or so and and talk about all the great things that you and i were able to accomplish together and uh and or maybe in six months because that'll be our our year anniversary so um but uh you know it's like i said it's been nothing but um nothing but great nothing but awesome. So thank you very much, man. Yeah. Yep. So listeners, thank you from my heart for listening to this episode and for really diving in there and uh, giving it your all. I mean, this doing this kind of work takes energy and intention and focus. And sometimes it can even be a little bit confronting and, and so it takes courage. And uh, so I congratulate you listener uh, for, for really diving in on, on this level. This is a different kind of episode than we've ever done before. And, uh, I think it is amazing. So, uh, if I do say so myself, uh, so on that, everybody have a great week and we'll see you next on the next apartment guys. Take care, everybody. Thanks for listening to the apartment guys with Tate Seymour. Tate and friends are grateful to have you as a loyal listener. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe, rate, review, and share with friends on your Apple podcasts, Google play, Spotify, or any other podcast platform. Also check out Tate's YouTube channel for videos of many of these episodes and more until next time, take massive action steps and rock on.